just a quick intro. My name is Ben Shalgren. I work for Top Tier Capital Partners, BC Fund of Funds, five and a half billion AUM. 20% of that is in healthcare, and that's mainly early stage drug development. I'm jokingly the internal healthcare guy because uh, I think we should do more than 20%, and uh, hopefully you'll see why after today. So, you know, for, for the panelists here today, we have really some, some impressive individuals. I'm going to turn to each of you, and if you don't mind, give me a quick background of yourselves, and, and I'll ask you a kind of a quick question. I think today, a lot of what we're going to talk about is uh, fundamentals and momentum in the industry and, and why we're all really excited. This is going to be mainly a, a VC-focused panel, but we'll get into kind of the role and that private equity can play. So, Francesco, maybe we'll start with you. Uh, company creations is, is a specialty of your group. Uh, and, and so if you don't mind defining uh, what that is uh, and, and kind of the, the the process behind it, because a lot of LPs just hear it all the time, but maybe don't exactly know all the things you guys do around it. Yes, thank you, Ben. Thank you for having me on the panel. Uh, Francesco De Robertis. I'm a general partner with Medici, a life sciences venture capital shop uh, based in Europe, London and Geneva. Um, and as Ben was saying, clearly we have been spending the last 25 years uh, focused on company creation. And what company creation means for us is really starting with the crazy idea of an entrepreneur, of a scientist, a professor, a, an innovator in some university scattered around Europe or in some large pharmaceutical companies around the globe or in some biotech company, uh, an idea, a thought, a, a, a piece of innovation that doesn't find either enough support or funding in the context of the current endeavor or environment where the innovator uh, is based. And so usually we start with that. Um, we get contacted or we, uh, we come across this idea, this innovator with his or her own idea. And we start really aggregating the minimum, the, the lightest, the uh, more agile possible company around him or her in order to start um, uh, investing on the idea and on the prosecution of that idea, knowing that the, the ideas get de-risked along the way. So we start with a business model where we start investing little and then we increase the amounts of cash that we have at risk. And of course, the best case scenario is when we go all the way uh, until we are home free. And at that, at the back end of that outcome, of course, the, 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 the driver is that there is a, a drug, a, a therapeutic approach, a treatment for patients, which was not there before. So that is in, 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 a, in a couple of minutes, our approach to company formation. Thanks. And so Arthur, you know, if, if you don't mind defining just the, the capital ecosystem today of like, okay, from company creation, where do we go? And, and what are kind of the buckets uh, by stage that, that you guys internally uh, define them as? Yeah, thank you very much, Ben. So Arthur Franken, I'm a general partner at Gilda Healthcare. And um, today I think Gilda Healthcare finds itself in a very um, rich, mature ecosystem in the biotech space in Europe. We are um, operating transatlantically, but our biotech investment strategy since more than two decades now is exclusively focused on the European um, uh, continent. Um, and what we are trying to do there is really source European world-class science, uh, but not necessarily in, in the kind of company creation mode, but we do um, uh, build companies, uh, more, I think, more sustainable European companies, I want to say, platforms. That, were, that is typically what we have been good at. Um, and we find we find ourselves today in a mature ecosystem ranging from the typical venture creating firms, seed funds, uh, through to, to mid-stage, late-stage funds with really cross-fertilization with US crossover investors. So the biotech scene in Europe is clearly um, maturing uh, with now even the first European biotech companies going commercial stage, uh, truly being multi-billion uh, dollar drug uh, drug development and commercialization companies. So at Gilda, we've been pretty successful in in building uh, a few, um, yeah, well, European unicorns, and um, and I think we find ourselves in a pretty good climate right now. You can kind of find investors 
all kinds of colors, flavors, and whatever you want as an entrepreneur. It's really our role to make these European discoveries ready to compete on a global scale, and also to find, recruit, and retain top talent that operate these drug development strategies. Thanks. And, and Joe, then I guess as we, we turn to you, there's a lot of capital in the ecosystem. I mean, it's been hinted at all today. Where do you see uh, the most pressure from new investors uh, into the space? And, and how's that kind of changed what you guys are doing? I think you're on mute, Joe. Yeah, thanks, Ben. I uh, appreciate being on the panel today. I appreciate the invitation to the organizers. Um, I'm Joe Anderson. I'm a partner at Sofanova Partners. Um, we're a European focused uh, uh, organization. Been around quite a long time now, 48 years in venture capital, based in Paris, uh, London, and, and Milan. Um, and the, the organization really has, has evolved with the evolving landscape of um, biotech life sciences. The, you know, we have seed funds, we have funds dedicated to, to seed investing, you know, prof with an idea, um, take it forward to the next step. Um, the, the organization is best known for its capital funds, um, you know, company formation, early stage, innovative breakthrough science, back to over 500 companies um, in, in the 48 years. And the most recent development has been to establish what's known as a cross era fund. Um, and this is a fund to really help companies when they're that they've moved from proof of concept to to to, to main to, to some mainstream. You know, we're we're looking to to plug that gap, um, particularly in Europe, where we see a huge need for growth capital, late stage capital, to take companies from proof of concept through to drug development and, and marketing of the drug. Um, so that that fund was set up two or three years ago, and we see a fantastic opportunity. The U.S. has very deep pools of capital in this area. Much so, much less so do we see that um, need for capital being addressed in Europe. And so Sofanova has, has um, taken an initiative there to, to move into the crossover investing phase. And that's a piece of the group that I'm involved with. So Francesco, do you see financing as a major risk when you're creating a company today? No, uh, honestly, I don't see that. And, and focusing on European companies, right? Let's let's focus as European on European companies. Um, very clearly, um, today, biotech, biotechnology, and the pharmaceutical industry are very clearly in the eyes of the observers, right? Simply because of the situation that we've gone through 20, to 2020. Very clearly, now the, the the large audiences are very aware and very clear on what is the value of of what we are trying to do in the pharmaceutical R&D world, uh, and and you know there has always been a lot of capital for companies. The problem is really capital is only one of the components that is key and necessary for the growth of of pharmaceutical R&D stage biotechnology companies. Uh, the other things are really know how, access, network, pharmaceutical awareness. So there is a lot of capital that is coming into the business, but we run the risk that this capital is not channeled in the right way into the right companies. Uh, because of course, um, inundating the industry with, with capital can have the, the, the negative effect. So it's really very, very important that the capital that comes into the industry and for which there is always need because there is so many drugs that need to be developed that really comes through in ways in which in which uh, you know it can be controlled and, and channeled appropriately. Otherwise, we run the risk of really uh, uh, spoiling the opportunity that, that we have as as people that that really want to identify drugs and molecules for uh, unmet medical needs. I think that that is my impression in Europe. Yeah. And so, staying on the theme of risk, are there how how do you def decide where to spend your time with all these these different um, you know, companies that are being created and, and asset types and um, just like what, what fundamental technology risk will, will you guys take at uh, Gilda? Yeah. So I think when, I, when I'm um, thinking about the biotech investment strategy that we have been pursuing for, for some time now, the risk really spans all the way from typically drug discovery, target risk, 
uh, technology risk if you want. There's an immense growth of new therapeutic modalities, all doing doing something different to to try to benefit the patient. Uh, but the risk uh, translates all the way through to preclinical, clinical development, regulatory reimbursement, even market risk, uh, not to be underestimated. So um, for us, it's essential operating kind of with a 10 years fund life, captive fund, to try to capture the true value inflection points within the typical timelines that our LPs want to, to, to see in a fund like us, ready to identify from the specific product market combination, the single most relevant value inflection point um, in, in the drug development cycle. Um, typically, uh, we would rarely uh, see entry points into commercial stage biotech, but um, so we always find ourselves somewhere in that drug discovery development chain. It really, it really depends, Ben, on on which product market indication you're looking at. Uh, just to be to be clear on this, if, if we would be looking at the phase 2B cancer drug opportunity, I think we should be scratching our head to say, okay, why didn't anyone else pick this up? Um, because oncology is pretty much about early partnering and big pharma consolidation play. Um, so uh, for us, uh, being active and successful in biotech, uh, is all about knowing what you are supposed to know, know the unknowns, and kind of identify the risks early and have the tools and methodologies and technologies available to, to de-risk at any specific stage. Um, for Gilda, we always engineer actively our investment case in a three years time to the single most relevant value inflection point. Uh, what happens afterward, an M&A, an IPO, or refinancing, we don't care, we, we, we are financial managers, we can manage all those scenarios, but that's pretty much what we are doing. And um, we don't call ourselves a preclinical fund, a post-clinical proof of concept fund, that's just not what, what I think we do. We dynamically allocate across all biotech sectors, across all stages. So Joe, are there therapeutic areas that, that you guys still will not invest in? I mean, there are, when you hear a pitch uh, from any life sciences VC, uh, there's, there's usually, you know, a focus. So it's generally, I mean, globally, like 50% oncology and then fill in the rest. And so, you know, maybe that's true. Maybe that's not. I, Joe, just for you guys at Sofanova, like, are there still uh, indications that, that are just too risky from a fundamental perspective? I think, I think we're pretty agnostic um, about therapeutic area. In fact, increasingly, I think, um, I'm sure my colleagues on the panel will, will probably agree, that, that um, the, the top-down focus on therapeutics is fading away. Um, you know, I don't think many groups would say, I've got to be so much exposed in oncology or neurobiology or, or whatever. Um, and I think part of that's been driven by the science. And I think it is important to, to try and convey just how exciting and dynamic the science is in our field, and that's where I think most of our focus is in this industry today. Um, you know, big breakthroughs, we've got to remember the human genome was first sequenced 20 years ago today, um, over 20 years ago. Um, and we know that the, the understanding of disease processes, regardless of which therapeutic area is in, has, has blossomed incredibly. We, we now can understand the molecular and immunological pathways leading to many different disease areas. So I think the focus is on where the breakthrough is in the science more than where the breakthrough is in the therapeutic area. You know, we can cite some, some, some classic examples. In, um, in cell therapy, um, we've seen huge advances in the treatment of patients with, um, uh, with uh, blood-borne cancers, leukemias, using something called CAR-T therapy. We know DNA damage re repair, you know, stopping cancer cells from repairing themselves. That, that is a fundamental biological process we now understand has led to massive new um, drug class and others to come behind it. In, in inflammation, you hear buzzwords like NLRP3, you know, technical new targets that look like they're being cracked. And I think that's where the focus is. And I think from a, from a money manager's point of view too, that is important because the opportunity if you get a significant breakthrough in a new target pathway or a new area of biology, 
is profound in early stage companies that we see are being acquired for very large considerations up front by their pharma um, majors. And also that the, the markets are receptive to these breakthrough new ideas. And we're seeing record numbers of companies with no clinical data going public. I mean, that is partly a feature of the bubble we're in at the moment, but it is also partly a feature of that this is an increasingly sophisticated market. And I think the focus is more and more on where are the step changes in science we're seeing, because that's where the value is, rather than going after an incremental improvement in, um, in a cancer treatment. I think the, the point you made there about, um, you know, what really we refer to as genetic validation um, of, of an asset uh, has, has changed the way our returns, at least internally and top tier um, have, you know, it's about, if you look at the, the upper echelon of life sciences, VC since about 2008, people are making a lot of money. Um, and, and so Arthur, maybe if you can talk about that genetic validation and the competition around those assets and how has that changed uh, the, the VC game in, in your opinion around life sciences? Absolutely, Ben. When, when we come across a genetically validated target, clearly with a loss of function genetic defect that validates that target in, in that respective phenotype, and we're on top of it. We're really on top of it. We love that. We love those insights. We think that has been clearly one of the more recent catalysts of the entire biotech field in the major improvements in R&D efficiency that have been realized. Uh, I think that also enables you to uh, attract the interest of the big pharma consolidators early on. So there, there's lots to like about those investment opportunities. Um, it, it requires, um, the, the competition around those assets is severe. It's really significant. It's, um, it's really significant. Um, uh, but nevertheless, um, it's, um, uh, it, it's truly an opportunity. Whether we approach it uh, exclusively via, um, so, so I think the other thing that, that we are actually, as we speak now, closing a deal on, is a completely novel therapeutic modality that enables to drug the un previously thought undruggable. And there are many, let's say, genetically validated targets that can be translated all the way through to the specific patient disease phenotype uh, for which there is just no therapeutic modality available because of X, Y, Z. And our most recent investment that will be announced now in, in March is one of those new therapeutic modalities that is able to drug that protein or multiple proteins from which the scientific and clinical community has been convinced for decades already that that is the way to go. So that also enables really the biotech sector to, to, um, to improve efficiency in R&D. It's an explosion of therapeutic modalities. For us at Gilda, trying to build companies, those are the perfect storms, right? Uh, you, you can go after those targets, you can use those modalities for multiple applications and you can build a pipeline. Um, so yes, Ben, that's definitely a key theme for us. And that also enables us to invest early and, and really have this unique leapfrog idea of de-risking, this genetically validated target. But you're right. Thanks, yeah. yeah, thank you. I, I think Francesco, I, I wanna turn to you and, and talk about momentum now. Um, I, I think people have an idea of, of the state of play. Um, and just in, in summary, a lot of capital at the late stage, tons of new innovation, um, great science. The backdrop we haven't talked about is, is the acceleration from COVID. Um, and just the ecosystem is now in the spotlight. So, so Francesco, if you could just compare uh, five years ago versus today, how, how, is it, how has it changed for you guys? Yeah, yeah. So thanks, Ben. And I do think I would like to, to take again a point that Joe was making a few minutes ago, which is maybe not absolutely obvious, uh, uh, you know, when you are just outside of this industry. But one point that I would like to make is that we are living inside the industry a, a, an unprecedented moment. And I think we also have, you know, the tools to demonstrate that that is the case. And, you know, what I mean is the following. I've been doing this like Joe and, and Arthur for many, many years. Um, I've been doing this for 22, 23 years. And what has happened in biotech that has been 
you know, linked to some major milestones in the industry, the human genome that was sequenced, you know, many different milestones that the industry has been able to achieve, there has been a moment of excitement and then a cycle down in which the excitement, of course, gets, gets under the cinetic, the kinetic of supply and demand on any public markets. And so biotechs, as many other sectors, have been subject to the usual, you know, ups and downs, cycles, fluctuations that are normal for, you know, for markets and which are driven by sector rotations. What we've seen in the last 10 years, uh, you know, in line with breakthrough improvements and, and a revolution inside the drug development and pharmaceutical industry, it looks like we have broken through the cycle concept. For the last 10 years, I cannot recall a, a year where I've not been saying, oh, this year is better than last year. And the last, the last year was better than the previous one. So this momentum, which of course, it looks like momentum because of course it is a very hot and biotech is, is firing on all cylinders. But I really do think that there is one feature which, which really impresses me, which is, I think for the first time in 20 years, I see some sort of loss of cyclicality and pharmaceutical really being an important fundamental sector because in the end, uh, you know, we are all growing old, the population grow, grows old, cancer doesn't go away, new diseases, chronic diseases don't go away. And so there is unfortunately an ever increasing need for new therapeutics, new drugs, new therapeutic approaches. And so that is really the fundamental value driving uh, for, the, for the pharmaceutical industry, which is not linked to a, to a trend, to a fashion, to a specific moment. So as we're becoming so good at drug discovery, and when I say we, I'm talking as an industry, of course, as we're becoming so good at drug discovery, so good at doing something which is so important and central to society, and guess, guess, COVID is demonstrating that to everybody, not just to us, which are operators in the industry. So we, Joe, Arthur, myself, we know that 25 years ago, 70% of cancer diagnoses were lethal. Today, those 70% are, you know, the vast majority of those cancer diagnoses are sort of chronic uh, diagnoses, which is not good news, but these are manageable diagnoses only 20 years ago. So to us inside the industry, we can really see the enormous progress that we are making. From the outside, maybe COVID as this, you know, I don't want to sound cynical, but it's got this benefit for the industry, which is COVID is demonstrating to the large public, which has a really important role for the well-being of the industry, but is demonstrating to the large public what is the impact of pharmaceutical R&D. Simply, you know, a new disease that was not known on January 2020, today we've got vaccines and we've got approaches. And if we were all disciplined that we would get vaccinated as we should, probably we would be able to go back in bars and restaurants and, and, and common places. Uh, you know, that is amazing. And because COVID has been so relevant to everybody, to every family, uh, everyone, not just the ones that have got, unfortunately, a cancer patient in their family, but everybody, that is probably demonstrating to, to the large public why pharmaceutical is really an important space and is not a fashion place or an investment place. It's really a fundamental place of society. And as we now know that it's also possible to make explosive returns, of course, this is attracting a lot of attention from investors and institutions which is good for the industry as long as we utilize that capital appropriately and we do not you know, start doing the wrong utilization of the capital to finance things which do not need financing. Can, can I pick up on that, Ben? Yeah, can I, can I, yeah. yeah, because Ben, I, I, think, I think Francesca makes a really super important point here for this, for this panelist audience um, in that it, I think we have gone beyond the cyclical phase. Um, look, we have had, you know, <laughs> enormous advances previously hiv when that hit it was a, a killer disease you, you were dead it's death sentence uh, now we can manage hiv um, hepatitis c pretty much managed nowadays it's a dreadful disease untreatable but i think if covid that's now hit everybody you know the, globally we're aware of what success this industry is all about and it really is quite phenomenal to have got a vaccine within a year when previously the cycle was you know much much longer than that so a lot of that is a science and it's driven a lot of it from RNA biology. Nobody had heard of RNA um, medicines five years ago, now it's mainstream. So I think that point is extremely well made. But to put it in a broader picture, um, you know, I, I often like to compare where we are today in life sciences as to where tech was 10 years ago. Um, 
And it's quite extraordinary. I didn't really realize until I'd looked it up how long ago the internet was uh, founded. And it was 1983 by some measure, so nearly 40 years ago now. Um, and today, that's within that's about a generation. And within one generation, we there is not an aspect of tech that does not touch people's lives today. Uh, the way we run our lives, the, the way economies are driven, the largest companies in the world are all tech driven. Okay, so life sciences has lagged that. And you know, 20 years ago we had the Human Genome Project. We now have enabling technologies, and I see life sciences today as where tech was. 10 years ago, and we're just beginning to see that. I think it's a great way of putting it, Francesco. We've broken out of the cyclicality, the up and down, the excitement. And, and I think we see a sustained drive towards really transforming you know, lives and economies with this, with this science. And I think venture capital is at the heart of that. And there, is, there are some differences, I think, with other aspects of private equity, perhaps, in that the science is key here. Once, I think Art made a good point, once you have genetic validation, you've really got value there. Um, and that's a key development. And then enabling it through to a drug or a product that helps patients is a complex process. And that's why you have the intellectual property protection that you do in this sector. So there are features which are different from uh, tech and there are features which mean that I think life sciences will always be VC driven rather than PE driven, um, but a topic for debate perhaps. Pretty, pretty good decade uh, for tech performance. I'm just going to say that. So if, if we're saying we've we've got the next 10 years uh, to enjoy that in, in life sciences, <laughs> yeah. I'm a fan. Uh, so all right, Jim, Jim made an uh, interesting point, and, and I think maybe we'll transition to that here on, on the role of private equity um, in, in the space. W what do you see the, the difference for you guys and when you're dealing with the VC actors versus private equity and, and maybe just quickly, like what's the opportunity for, for private equity in the space? Yeah, if, if I can give it a, a shot, I think in, in venture capital kind of, by the way, at Gilda Healthcare, we also have a private equity arm. It's a separate fund, separate strategy. Uh, it's completely different people. <laughs> No, but um, in, in venture capital, I think the currency is all about data, uh, experimental data, whether that's preclinical, clinical, and, and how these data are being valued and perceived. And that is in venture capital, I think, your, your currency, whereas my PE colleagues are looking at top line and bottom line multiples, leverage pretty much financial engineers. They look three years backward for a healthy, you know, um, profit margin and, and see how they can optimize the business and optimize the financial metrics. In venture capital, in biotech, uh, really the true venture capital is about de-risking at the right time, is about capturing that major impactful value inflection point, and it's about generating the data that the market will, wants to see to consolidate it. Now, private equity definitely is starting to, to enter the sector. Um, uh, clearly, they, they can play a role. Uh, I think some of the bane, banes of this world and, and others are, are finding their way. I still see it more as a venture capital strategy, what they're pursuing. But nevertheless, they come in with big money and they feel they fill certain gaps in the biotech financing ecosystem. Definitely. Uh, definitely. They can play true late stage opportunities. They can help pharma in funding major spin-outs, really major divisions. Um, so, but, but clearly I think our, our type of play, the venture capital play is much better done by truly dedicated VC funds that, that know how to generate data, know how to value data, know how to pick those value inflection points. Thanks. And we have uh, about 10 minutes left. So I, I, I do wanna go maybe, um, quick round the horn. Um, this is a European panel. And if you guys all wouldn't mind um, as a, you know, go down down the line, I'd, I'd love to hear just what you find to be the most exciting part of investing in European life sciences, you know, over the next couple of years and, and why it's, it's such a great opportunity. Maybe uh, Francesco, I'll, I'll start with you and put you on the spot. Yes. Uh, thanks, Ben. I, I would just say just, I would just quote one number to describe the business opportunity of investing in the life sciences, and I mean drug development, pharmaceuticals, life sciences in Europe, which is the following. 
every year, year in, year out, maybe 20 to 30 percent of the drugs that get approved by the American FDA, you know, let's say one quarter, 25 percent on average, are comp molecules, drugs that were originally discovered in Europe, but that, of course, because there is no capital in Europe really allocated to you know this part of the this industry in a massive way, as massive as the U.S. Of course, they find their way into the U.S. And actually, if I look at the venture capital as a proxy for what I'm saying, um, in Europe, there are maybe 10 venture capitalists that, that have 50, 60% of the market share. Uh, three of them are here, of course. Uh, very concentrated, very little supply of capital, and still 25% of the drugs that every year the FDA approves come out of Europe. So there is an argument on, and you know, oftentimes when I discuss with my LPs, why shouldn't we expand into the US in a strategic way? Sure, we do investments in the US, but the big opportunity is here because here there is a, an ecosystem which is not fully served to the extent that it could be served by, by lack of capital. And I'm focusing on venture capital, of course. Mm -hmm. Joe, you wanna go next? Yeah, look, I think Francesco said it well. Um, you know, it's a much more complex market. Um, it's, it's not one market, you know, it's different cultures, different regions. Um, different languages. Um, so it is much more difficult to navigate than, than say the US and that's what makes it interesting for me. Um, I think all three groups on this panel are, are very well connected into Europe. Um, if, I'd, if I'd highlight one uh, point as an investor that I find exciting um, is that the valuations continue to be significantly lower on entry uh, into European opportunities than they are in the US. Um, the U.S. is much more sophisticated, more sophisticated, you know, deeper pool of capital, uh, deeper pool of company opportunities, deeper pool of management teams able to take um, ideas further. Um, and with that, have come, of course, and the and, and the the sort of weight of capital that's gone into the sector in in the last year or two, uh, we are seeing prices going up. So you know, we're often seeing deals in the U.S. And of course, we can. I'm sure we can all do deals in the U.S. And we we do it soft and over partners. Um, selectively, uh, but we're seeing valuations getting out of reach. You know, we, may, we may love the company and love the technology and the team, um, but oftentimes it's being bid up um, by um, just sheer weight of capital. We're seeing a bit of that beginning in Europe, but we're a long way behind. And I think for me, if you can find an opportunity in Europe, it's, it's often that the entry valuation is lower and, that, and that's got to help your returns. Yeah, if, if so, I can add a bit to that, Joe, I think whenever you, me, or Francesco starts a company or, or basically creates a spin out or we do, we lead a Series A investment, I think really from the get go, this is not a European company anymore. Mm -hmm. We source it in Europe, we identify interesting European signs, but we know that biotech is about global competition. So if we identify gaps in management team, very often I see it as our role, our fiduciary duty to build that bridge to the US because let's be frank, the capital markets are in the US. Euronext is still not there. And, and the European stock exchanges are way too fragmented. We've been all over this, so I, I will stop here. But um, from the get-go, we make our uh, drug development companies uh, uh, globally competitive. Um, so, and, and the valuation arbitrage, I think, is just a matter of time if it's there. I'm coming across very high priced European companies as well. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know whether that's a durable advantage for, for, from my point of view. Great. Well, with about five minutes left, uh, I'll encourage uh, anybody in the audience to, to please submit a question in the chat. Uh, we did do a poll uh, here, and, and it's uh, do you think you'll increase your allocation to biotech in the next year? And we have 50% of respondents saying they'll increase and 50% say keep the same. Um, so no, no decreasing in the, the post-COVID era. Uh, <laughs> so that's, that's a good sign. Uh, we do have one question uh, here. It's uh, around joint ventures with uh, big pharma and early stage companies. So it says, what's your view on the role of big pharma as an early stage investor in biopharma companies alongside joint venture relationships? Has this changed and where do you think it's going? You know, I can, I can pick on somebody or if anybody, um, you know, wants to take a shot at that one here on the panel. 
Yeah, we're now leading a, a deal with two corporates in it, and, and I very much welcome them because the, the space in which we are investing is, is a pretty active space where there's been a lot of pharma deal making, and their added value to this syndicate is definitely visible. Um, we, we do believe that they should not be in a lead position. They should just be in a co-investor position and really kind of be part of the syndicate in a healthy balance. I think the ideal number is out of a syndicate of four, have two financial investors and two corporate investors just to pick a number. But clearly they, they, help, they help the early teams to, to build their companies. And yeah, good floor. Thanks. I have, a, I have a question to myself. So for, for you three guys at the cutting edge of science, like what, what uh, if, if we could quickly go through, what's, what's one new technology that uh, you think is, is really exciting? Maybe, uh, Joe, can we start with you? <laughs> Put me on the spot. Um, yeah, you know, again, I, I, would, I would say that my, my personal belief that a lot, of, a lot of disease processes stem from a process known as inflammation. So when you get the flu, uh, you, you're not getting sick from, from the virus being there. You're getting sick from an in, inflammatory process. That's, that's what makes you feel unwell. We, know, we now know that that attaches to a lot of cancer development, uh, a lot of um, autoimmune diseases. Um, and, and if anything, it, I think inflammatory processes are central to so many disease processes, regardless of which therapeutic area. So I do think some of the breakthroughs that we're seeing in um, inflammatory biology, there are a number of targets, that they, they've got technical names, but there's about five or six key targets which the industry is chasing at the moment. And they are early stages and they do seem to be validated. But um, hopefully we'll see some of those um, play through into, um, into therapeutic advances. So, so I would say inflammation for me and advances there are pretty key. Thanks. Francesco? Uh, yeah, I, I am very impressed with the, uh, with the power and the potential of gene editing as a way of modifying the genetic sequence of your genes in order to remove away disease away from, from you. That is in its infancy. It's still not done, but we've got in the last few years the technological breakthroughs in order to make that happen. And so that's very scary. It's very dangerous depending on the use that you do with that. But the therapeutic application of gene editing, I do believe it's a game changer in therapeutics. How about you, Arthur? Yeah, and for me, that's, that's partially overlapping with gene editing. Gene editing is one of the tools to do it, but for me, it's kind of the overarching concept of in vivo reprogramming therapies. And that's all about, that's really enabling to realize regenerative therapy. That means in vivo, in the body, you can reprogram cells to become another cell. And you do that with whatever modality, whether it's gene editing or gene therapy or so, so it's really in this world of, of rich modalities that truly we do not only dream about it, but we can see it happening for type 1 diabetes to be cured soon. Great. A few more billion dollar companies, I'm, I'm sure, across these, uh, these areas. I, we do have two minutes left. So one quick question that came in. Uh, top five countries in Europe for biotech. Uh, maybe if you could quickly hit on just like the large hubs uh, for biotech versus maybe picking out specific countries. Uh, uh, Francesco, you want to give it a shot? Yeah. So, so clearly Cambridge, Oxford, London, that triangle is a, is a really great place. Um, and, and another one that I would cite is the Basel Zurich area. These are two hotspots uh, in Europe. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Well, thank you. I mean, we do have a question on, on, rare diseases and, and rare drugs. Uh, Joe, you want to just say the opportunity there quickly? I, we have a minute left. Yeah, look, very briefly, you know, orphan drugs, rare diseases. You know, I think with going back to the gene, validated gene therapy targets, we're seeing a lot of progress. A lot of rare diseases, a lot of orphan diseases are affected by a single gene. Um, and I think we're seeing advances there. My hope is that we'll see um, those fill out into broader diseases, which are more complex than many of the orphan diseases. Great. Well, thank you so much. I want to thank all you guys for your time. Uh, really appreciate it. And um, I think we'll, we'll hand the mic back over and, and hope you all have a great day.